insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights Into Tomorrow. This is episode five, SETI. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my co-host, Sam Whalen, is with me today. How are you doing today, Sam? I'm doing okay. Okay, so SETI was recently in the news um, for shutting down their SETI at Home program, and it, it kind of made me start thinking about the significance of SETI and the history of SETI and, and sort of where we're going with you know, our search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So I thought that'd be a good topic for us to discuss today. Uh, So I guess the first thing we should probably do is define what SETI actually is. Uh, SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is a collective term for scientific searches for intelligent extraterrestrial life. For example, monitoring electronic radiation for signs of transmissions from civilizations on other planets. Uh, SETI does not necessarily get involved in the popular UFO culture. Um, However, I will confess to being a bit of an addict of uh, ancient aliens watching that TV show. You ever watch that? Uh, I've seen the memes of the one guy, like the really, like, yeah. Yeah, the 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 hair. hair. (laughs) Yeah, but I can't say I've ever watched it. My problem with those shows is that, like, they're always like, this is the one. We finally found them. And then by the end, they're like, nah, we didn't find anything. Next week. <laughs> right, right. So. Um, what I actually like about, um, and this is a, kind of off topic, but what I do like about Ancient Aliens is less the almost crazy I'm, I found aliens type thing and more the technology that they look at. Um, and they look at real world technology almost to, to say, oh, well, maybe this is so advanced that it came from aliens. And, and, and okay, if you want to go down that path, you can. Um, but the thing that I kind of like about it is seeing that technology and seeing what they're using to find or to search for aliens and stuff like that. So I don't necessarily think that they're, let's say, barking up the right tree. Um, but I do think that there is some educational content there from at least a technology and a history standpoint to make it worth watching. Yeah, it's better than like a Bigfoot show. Because yeah. what's that going to offer? Really? Exactly, exactly. Um, so, but we're talking about SETI, which is a legitimate um, tax funder, taxpayer funded uh, scientific organization that the government had actually funded. And we'll talk about that you know, in in the history section there. But SETI itself is almost exclusively radio telescope, radio emissions. Uh, And there's a practical reason for that. You know, we're really far away from other planets. Um, And as far as we know, from a scientific standpoint, nothing travels faster than the speed of light in the universe right now. So the one thing that could possibly get here, theoretically, would be radio transmissions. Um, You know, we as a civilization have been producing radio transmissions for a little over 100 years now. Um, And we don't transmit them in any significant broadcast power outside of the planet. But, you know, there's our radio transmissions from the 20s and 30s that are probably hitting the closest... Um, stars nearby us at this point in time. Yeah, that's that's really interesting to me, especially like how that works with how time passes. So like you know, on a smaller scale, like when the astronauts went to the moon, they're like they're they aged 
either slower or faster, I forget. Slightly slower, yeah, yeah, because of the speed that they were going. So even just, I mean, the moon's obviously very far away, but compared to, like, the sun, just that small dilation, you get that, that time thing. Yeah. I don't know, it was, um, it's an episode of one of the Star Trek where they're hearing transmissions from a planet, and they're like, we gotta go rescue them. And then when they get there, they find out they've been dead for, like, 200 years. Right, right, because yeah, so, of the radio transmissions mm-hmm. took so long yeah, to get yeah. there. Um, so... We'll, we'll we'll talk a briefly about the history and, and where some of the science came from for it. Uh, we'll also talk about um, whether there's anything that, that could be out there. But mathematically, we'll talk about the Drake equation, which is really a big, giant scientific guess. You know, I mean, it's, it's the great unknown, and we're trying to make things up as we go along. And then, you know, we'll talk about, is it worth it? You know, is all this money that we're spending looking for alien life really worth it because of everything that, that's going on here that could probably benefit from that money? And then we'll talk about the implications of what if we find something or what if something finds us, uh, which Stephen Hawking thought was a, uh, a danger lurking out there if we poke our nose where it shouldn't be. Um, so we'll take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll talk about the brief history of SETI. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So a brief history of SETI. I mean, SETI, everyone, when people think of aliens, they think of Roswell, right? So 1947 or whatever, UFO crashes, and and people think that that's really where we start studying aliens. Um, And the scientific study of aliens really doesn't take off with SETI uh, until 1959. Um, A Cornell physicist named Giuseppe Cocconi and Philip Morrison published an article in Nature in which they were pointed out the potential for using microwave uh, radio communication between stars. And this was right around the time that we discovered what's been coined as the, the mic, uh, microwave, galactic microwave uh, background radiation, basically what's the leftover soup from the Big Bang. And in there, people are, are pointing out that there's signals that can be interpreted from that. In uh, 1960, we had Frank Drake, um, who gave us the Drake equation. He conducted the first microwave radio search for signals in other solar systems. Um, And then really, the United States kind of loses interest in it at this point in time. It's kind of an academic study more than anything until the Soviets pick it up and the Soviets start looking at it. So immediately the United States sees that and realizes, oh, it's a Cold War thing. They're using it for weapons. Space race, too, around this time. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so we are at the height of the space race in the 60s into the 70s. Um, in early 70s, uh, Ames Research Center at NASA, uh, they produced the first comprehensive study known as Project Cyclops. Oh, man, that sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> so it's at this point in time that the United States really starts to focus on it. Um, you have more radio telescopes that are out there now. Uh, this is before the giant radio telescopes like Arecibo and and these other telescopes that we have today. So it's it was more like a pet project more than anything. Um, and it was confined most of the universities because they were the only ones that had the resources for it. 
1977 saw probably the, the most significant radio signal that we saw. We, in fact, it was termed the wow signal uh, when Jerry Ehrman, who was a project volunteer at Ohio State, picked up this signal that was, I don't want to say off the charts, but it was a significant signal. And when he got it, because at the time, all your output was on paper. So where everything was plotted on, on a grid on paper and this one signal was huge and he wrote in the margins on the paper, wow. And it became known as the wow signal. Yeah. I've heard of this one before. Unlike those like, you know, clickbait top 10, uh, signs of alien life yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. They always cite this one. And I think a lot of people have kind of taken it and ran with it and like made it more than it might've been, but it's still cool. Cause there's the picture of it where, you know, you see the guy's handwriting, you're like, oh man. Right. Um, but you know. So now let me ask you, in your experience, you know, <coughs> you, you work in media now, so you work with radio transmissions and stuff like that. What kind of power does the transmitter that, that you work with right now put out? Uh, we have, so, cause we're a college station, we ha we're more of a low power, not quite low power FM in the traditional sense, but we are definitely lower power than like, you know, MMR or some of the bigger Philadelphia stations. Um, so when we do meter readings, I think we're within like nine, that like 700 to a thousand um, kilohertz or whatever the kilowatts. Kilowatts, yeah. Uh, I took my radio training test, but I don't remember the units. <laughs> um, I just know how to write down the numbers. Um, so we're definitely more low power, but we do transmit from Glassboro. I think we reach parts of the Jersey Shore and then to the bridges in the Philly, so like okay. around there. Um, so we do have a sizable audience, but obviously when you get the higher power stations, you're going to be able to reach you know much further. I think like MMR reaches all the way to North uh, PA, I think. Right. Right. Um, and you know, however far that is in New Jersey. So, so now the power readings that you take on your transmitter, you guys are licensed to us for a certain amount of power by the FCC. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the point of the meter readings is so that we don't go over. Cause if we go over or under, we'll bleed into different frequencies. So we're like, it, we'd go out of our, we'd bleed into like 88.5 XPN. Like we'd take over that cause we're 89.7. Uh -huh. So on the dial, if we go over or under with our power, we would infringe on, it's almost like territory, like space that, sure, that they yeah. have. So we'd be going into those zones. So you're just, assigned a certain frequency. Mm -hmm. That frequency is determined by the power that you transmit yep. at. And you have to stay within a certain range in order to stay on your frequency. Yep, exactly. So, and it's interesting to understand that concept of electromagnetic emissions when we talk about a signal that by all accounts reached us from billions of miles away. Yep. So if you're putting out, how much did you say? I, I believe it's within, I haven't been to the station in a while, obviously, but I think it's between uh, 700 to 800 and then like 1,000 uh, kilowatts. Kilowatts. So that, and that reaches roughly, say, 90 miles. Mm -hmm. Now, can you imagine how much power it would take to reach the Earth from another planet? Yeah. And to have one, like this signal here that stood out, enough to write wow on a piece of paper and that's not even factoring in like weather like i know like on a cloudy day or if there's thunderstorms that messes with signals so you'll sure. pick up like you'll get bleed through in stations like uh, the country station xtu and wmmr 93.3 will bleed together sometimes so yeah. just those environmental factors too mess with it so it's a very it's so fragile right. to begin with and you know to see this from however no you know however far it's, away it's funny you mention that because years ago when i used to be in the cb radio before the internet and everything cb was like how you talk to people because mm -hmm. uh, no one used the phone <laughs> um we would do what was called shooting skip. So under certain atmospheric conditions, the ionosphere would become charged before an electrical storm. And you used to, because normally what happens is when you transmit on a radio transmitter, it's omnidirectional. So it transmits everywhere equally. Well, when you shoot skip, what would happen is the ionosphere would charge with electrical particles. So when you would send a transmission up, instead of it bleeding out into space, it would hit the ionosphere, bounce off almost like it was a satellite relay, mm -hmm. and then allow you to send that signal further. And we would talk to people. Normally, you got about 20 miles out of a CB radio if you were lucky. And when we would shoot skip, you could talk to people out in Kentucky. Oh, wow. Uh, which is like a 1,000 miles yeah, away. Yeah. So it, it was just the, the, the mechanics, the physics of radio transmission are intriguing in how it works. Um, but that was what made this signal so interesting was that something was able to produce a signal that strong 
And the other thing you have to mind is that in 77, you didn't have this huge web of satellites in orbit now. Yeah, there wasn't like junk in the way. Right. Of- so what happens now is when these signals come in, people pick up these signals on a regular basis. And then what they'll do is they'll traverse the, the satellite receiver, the radio receiver, off target, back on target, and they'll do that from multiple vectors to make sure that it's not a satellite that they're getting a receiving signal from. And then what they'll do is they'll also contact other nearby satellites, uh, um, radio receivers, and have them triangulate that signal. Because if they all triangulate to the same spot, and that spot's only you know 50 miles above the Earth, right. then you know you're hitting a satellite. And that's becoming a real concern, especially now that you've got uh, Elon Musk putting up thousands and thousands of satellites so everyone can get internet. So that was the one of the biggest things, and that really got people very excited about it. NASA was still funding it at this time. Um, NASA... Uh, Ames and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, were both running programs at the same time. And then in comes your scientists, you know, your famous scientists, Carl Sagan being one of them, founding the Planetary Society. And then the Planetary Society then took it upon themselves to start doing more of a serious scientific research into the search for extraterrestrial intelligence through radio observatories. Um, they started developing the actual technology that, that is used today. In 1981, one of the ones they put out with a, was a portable spectrum analyzer, which they named uh, the Suitcase SETI. Um, and, and what it did was, frequency-wise, there's a monumental number of bandwidths that, that we can receive on. And the problem is, is that a, a radio receiver can only receive on one frequency at a time unless you have an antenna for every frequency. So what this actually was able to do was actually frequency hop across 131 different narrow bands and monitor for signals with a single antenna across all these bands. So they started introducing some of the technology that would later become uh, instrumental in this. And that technology evolved through the 80s and the 85 with the mega channel extraterrestrial array and then uh 88 uh, nasa formally adopted and funded their own seti program um which (laughs) congress terminated within (laughs) Within five five years years. (laughs) um because congress didn't see there was a benefit um and Um, it's hard it's hard to make an argument for and the problem is selling it right it's just like selling a space program you know, what's the benefit of the space program? What what would you say is the number one benefit to the space program? Find, I guess now in our modern times, it'd probably just be finding another habitable, uh, habitable planet, probably. Right. And that or resources. Concept, you can't explain that concept yeah. to a congressman who needs to get elected in two years. Right. Especially when you look how much it costs. Right. And public interest in general. I mean, after, we're looking at 1988, that's kind of when, I could be wrong, but that's kind of when public interest in space programs kind of started to decline. Well, you know, this is this is shortly this is right around the time that the Challenger yeah. disaster happened, so people were very, you know, gun shy about funding space. Um, but the real benefit to the space program has been and continues to be the advances in science and technology that come out of it. And I'm not talking about Tang, you know, the orange drink that the astronauts had wasn't actually invented for the space program, which is a you know misnomer. But the science of rocketry, aeronautics, um, computers. I mean, j- just the computer drive alone, you figure when we put men on the moon, I have about a thousand times more computing power on my wrist with my Apple Watch right now than what they had in their guidance computer. Um, so SETI was driving the same type of thing. It was an innovation race more than anything. And Congress didn't see it as that. And well, and, and if they did, you know, I'm not saying they didn't, but if they did, their idea was, well, let the private industry, let the private sector deal with that because they're the ones that are going to benefit from it. Um, NASA was, and still is a, a not for profit organization that holds thousands of patents and those patents get turned over to the private industry for public use. 
So the government wasn't going to make its money back on that, and Congress didn't want to keep funding it. So we get into the 90s, and SETI is now a privately funded organization here. They're, they're getting donations. They're getting uh, money from um, the academic side, from universities and such, and they start collecting data. And one of the antennas that they collected a lot of data from was the radio observatory in Mexico at Arecibo, which is a massive radio antenna that's built into the side of a mountain. Um, and it's interesting because it doesn't really move. Like you can, you can change the, the vector of the receiver and stuff like that, but it's fixed in place. And it's always looking at the sky. And they would gather radio data on this, but they couldn't analyze it. And they wound up with this glut of radio data. So they introduced what really was the first um, civilian distributed computer program. And that was SETI at home, where what they would do is they would take this massive chunk of radio information, they break it up into small blocks, and then users could download a program run the program, it would grab a block of data, seconds, you know, milliseconds of data, churn through this looking for specific information that they had the criteria set for. And if it found whatever it found, it would then transmit back. And they started collecting all this data. Uh, and I remember when SETI at Home launched, I was a, an early member of it because I thought it was a really cool idea. And that, again, that technology drove things like the Bitcoin industry now, you know, your, your, yeah. all your distributed computing applications that you have now, you're folding at home where folding at home is exactly the same thing. In fact, uh, the engine SETI at home wound up using in the long run was the same engine that folding at home is, is using. And folding at home is now being used for distributed computing to find, to analyze the coronavirus. Oh, okay. Uh, and break it down. And, and the data from that and simulations is being used to help find a um, vaccine for it. So all that was a direct benefit from what these guys did in 1999. Um, in uh, 2009, City at Home Project had over 180,000 active participants volunteering over 290,000 computers. Now, I will say that that equation is probably conservative because people like me, I had probably eight, nine computers at home and probably six computers at my office that were churning away to do this. So that you had, and then you had university groups, you know, they would, they had a leaderboard. And you could go in and look at that leaderboard. You can set up a team and people can join your team and you compete it to see who wow. generated the most computing power. Um, and at, at one point in time, the SETI at home project was the largest supercomputer in the world with all its computing power. They talk about computational power at 617 teraflops, which is just not to, you know, no pun intended, but it's astronomical to compute that stuff. And that's all being computed on home computers. That's a, that's an interesting way to go about it. Cause I mean, you're getting people from a business standpoint, you're getting people to work for free, but you're also making it competitive so exactly. that you have incentive to do it. You know, it's, it's ingenious. Well, and at the time you didn't receive any material benefit for doing mm. this. You received bragging rights. Um, you'd get a thank you letter annually from the board at SETI. Uh, for donating your time, but really you were doing it for the ad advancement of, yeah. of all mankind. And that, the that w however small chance that you're the one that finds, you know, another wow signal or something like that. Yeah. And, and to be honest with you, it was a really nice looking screensaver too. Oh, was it? <laughs> it was, it was a really cool screensaver. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of a, the history of it. You know, it started out by accident scientifically, you know, just, just a hobby almost, uh, the, the U S government, the universities adopted at that point in time, started funding it. Then the U S government didn't really get into it until the Soviets started looking into it. Uh, and then when Congress realized that they couldn't turn a buck on it, they basically gave up on it. 
and it was turned over to private investors. So, so one of the, the biggest private investors that they had uh, funding from was Paul Allen, who was one of the founding fathers of Microsoft. In fact, one of the largest radio telescope arrays in the world that SETI uses is the Allen Telescope Array. Um, and when he passed away, I think it was last year he passed away, it, it was really probably the nail in the coffin for SETI at home. Now, the reason that, that I bring this up is, uh, you know, there was a news article uh, a couple weeks back, right around the time that the whole coronavirus hit, um, that talked about SETI at home closing up shop, basically. They weren't soliciting information anymore, any input, um, because they've been piling up all this data and they haven't been able to finish their deep analysis on it. So they're moving into that later phase of their project where they've shut down all the solicitations for information. They're going to do their deep analysis and probably in about five or six years, we'll probably see what the results of that deep analysis are. So the shutting down of SETI at home after 20 years, 20 plus years, I thought was, was worthy of a discussion about the whole topic itself. Have you ever heard of any of any of the SETI at Home project, any of the work? The only thing of SETI I've heard of, and I mentioned this before we went on, uh, was an Independence Day. Right. Um, in the beginning of that movie, there's a guy playing golf that works for SETI, and they obviously portray it, you know, in a more dramatic fashion. Like the point is to show how bored this guy is because he's never encountered aliens. Right. So then he gets the transmission. He calls. He has a phone line directly to like the. Pentagon or the president? Sure, <laughs> and he's like, that's realistic. Mr. President, the aliens are here. <laughs> um, so that's the only SETI, uh, you know, depiction I've ever seen. Um, but hearing about the SETI at home, it's it's interesting that, you know, it was kind of like this almost underground uh, community thing, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, I think it's cool. Yeah, it was, a, it was a plot twist in several movies, Contact being another one, with I think it was Jodie Foster was in there. Mm-hmm where a lot, good portion of that movie was actually filmed at one of their radio arrays, the VLA, the very large array. Um, and, and the interesting thing, again, kind of a side note about the technology, in order to pick up signals that are so weak, you need very large antennas. Well, it's difficult to build an antenna that's miles wide. So what they've started to do was they've adopted a... Um, technique of using many antennas. So a bunch of smaller antennas that are arrayed in a pattern that can then work as a large one. Then there was work uh, early on to take satellite dishes and people that have old traditional, you know, the big satellite dishes before the dish antennas came out to take those in people's backyards and through software actually link all of those together but I don't know if that ever got off the ground. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's interesting that we've gotten some benefit out of it and hopefully, you know, what we did with the distributed computing will help us with the coronavirus now with folding at home. Yeah. I just think nowadays it's more, the focus is at least for profitability is on internet data and internet usage. So I could definitely see the, throughout the years as the internet becomes more dominant, the shift away from you know, looking at radio frequencies and interpreting that data and instead putting those efforts into internet data gathering and how that can be used, um, not by study, of course, but just in general, the general climate and the general focus more on how that data can be used, you know, to sell stuff. Yeah. And that's really what it is. I mean, if you don't have the money, you need to have a business model. Everyone needs money to function yeah. to get money in a business model and SETI's business model relied on charity yep so so we'll take another quick break we'll come back and we'll talk about are they really out there and how we can tell if they are insights into entertainment a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. 
We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. So are they out there? Let me ask you, do you think aliens exist? Uh, probably. Yeah. I mean, alien, I think there's some kind of living life out there. I don't know about like little green men, but you know, definitely like bacteria and stuff like that. Um, and we'll get into it. I didn't know there was an actual equation for it. Spoilers, but I always just figured just from a number standpoint, there's gotta be right. I mean, the universe is like incomprehensibly like huge, you know? Right. You would think mathematically, yeah, we can't be the only ones yeah. where life form. That was always kind of the stance I took on it was there's something out there somewhere, but maybe the odds aren't really on our favorite ever and encounter it. Right. No, and I agree. I mean, that's, I guess that's part of the problem is that the universe is so large that, that life has to exist elsewhere, but the universe is so large that it's almost impossible for us to encounter mm -hmm. it. And that's sort of where the Drake equation comes in. And we've mentioned Frank Drake in the first segment there. He was a scientist that sort of went through this thought experiment of how do we know if there's life out there? So in his equation, he takes into account the number of civilizations in our galaxy, which communication might be possible, which is a guess, right? Then he says on What's the average rate of star formation in our galaxy, which can be calculated from observation. Then what's the fraction of those stars that have planets. Now at the time he came up with this, we had no technology whatsoever that allowed us to actually find extrasolar planets, planets around other suns. Now we've got probably a half dozen different techniques and we're finding planets everywhere now, which at the time he put this together, that factor, that variable was a guess. Now they've got a pretty good idea of what that number is. So then he looks at the average number of planets that can potentially support life per star, which again, we can determine because in the ones that we look at now, we're seeing a lot of gas giants, which are the easiest ones to find. And, and one of the most common techniques is they look at the wobble of a star. So when you look at a star, we have high enough imaging of a star now to actually see if a large planet gravitationally pulls on a star and the star will wobble as that planet orbits it. Now those obviously we rule out because our definition of life is constrained to what we know. Right. So we would not expect to see life on a Jupiter because the atmosphere just isn't conducive to it. Um, they then look at the fraction of planets that can go on to develop intelligent life. And then the fraction of civilizations that develop technology that can release detectable signs of its existence in the space, which takes us back to the radio yeah. emissions we yep. talked about. And then you look at the length of time, which a civilization can release detectable signals to space. That is really kind of a key because we don't know. Um, that's basically how long does an advanced civilization last before it destroys itself? That's what it's being categorized as. That's a difficult number to make up, you know? In, indeed, because <clears throat> the only example we have right now is us, and yeah. that's about 100 years. Yeah. So in the grand scheme of things, you have to have enough stars with enough planets, with planets that can support life to form civilizations that last long enough to generate the technology that can then send a radio signal, then that radio signal has to travel for hundreds or thousands of, or millions of years to get to us here. And as we all know, when we look up at the night sky, we're looking at a time machine. That light that you see there is thousands or millions of years old. Yeah, I think... What is it? If the sun went out, we wouldn't know for like eight minutes or something like that. Yeah, we're about nine minutes away from the sun, depending <laughs> yeah. on the orbit. That's insane to think about. 
Right. So the Drake equation really was was kind of a thought experiment to get people to think of what are the chances. Yeah. But it's really just a guess. It's like if a really smart guy was like, all right, well, if I have to, I don't know, but if I had to put it into mathematical terms, here's all the variables we'd need to input, you know? Right. Now, if you go on and you look at the best case scenario where everything was in favor of us finding civil, civil, civilized life out there, you're looking at about 50 million civilizations could have existed from the Big Bang until now. Will we ever see any of them? I don't know. Um, but mathematically, this is, and this is sort of where we're talking about. This is just our galaxy, too. This yeah. isn't even talking about other galaxies. So mathematically, we could very well see um, civilizations out there at some point in time. Uh, the problem I think that we have is we have a tendency of limiting what we think of as life. I was just going to bring that up, yeah. Um, but you can go. I don't want no, to. No, no, please. Go um, ahead. Yeah, I think especially in like our depictions of sci-fi and stuff like that, it's all ve like human inspired. You, just because we can't expand our minds, I guess, in that past us, right? right? So especially in like you know Star Wars and Star Trek, all the aliens look like people, <laughs> just yeah. you know a different color or a different facial structure or something like that. But I think I don't know. I've thought about it before. We're like, what if there is life, but we just can't see it you know like what if we're just our brains or our eyes or something aren't calibrated to detect that kind of life you know or they're so small that we can't see them because of the size we are yeah and there's there's so many variables once you stop thinking of it in terms of would they look like us or would they fit the same definition of life that we have that you know you just fall down the rabbit hole kind of absolutely and, and i think one of the problems we we have is that when we think of life, we think of carbon-based life. You know, carbon-based life made up of enzymes and DNA and, you know, requires oxygen, requires water, requires a certain temperature. Um, and it, it's difficult for human beings to think outside of that. Even though we have examples of life that doesn't fit really what that definition is. Um, there's a lot of studies that are going on that look at uh, organisms that live in this really toxic environment at the bottom of the sea where the gas mole uh, molecular structure down there is, is the temperature is ridiculously hot. The oxygenation is almost non-existent. And these, these, these items, these, Organisms live off of methane and other what we consider to be poisonous gases. Are those the same ones that, like, when they shine a light on them, they, like, freak out because they've never seen light before because they're so deep? Because they're so deep yeah. in the ocean, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's like alien life. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And they've conducted experiments on the International Space Station with certain life forms, um, roaches being one of them, that survive in space. But there's this, this microscopic life form called tardigrades. Oh, yeah, the bears? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And these tardigrades, these little microscopic life forms, can live in space in, the, in radiation, no oxygen, in a vacuum. They can survive for months in space on the outside of the space station, then be brought back in, brought back to Earth, and a drop of water put on them, and they come back to life. So there's a lot to be said for the fact that there's life out there that doesn't respond to the environment the way the humans do. Um, and this sort of leads into the whole idea of transpermia, that life might have existed on other planets and uh, asteroid or comet impacts may have blasted into space and that's what seeded the Earth and stuff like that. So there's a lot of scientific theories about that, uh, which kind of leads you to, down the path that we might not be earthlings. You know, our origins might actually have been from another planet. There's, I don't know if you're into the Witcher at all. It's on Netflix as a show. And then there's books and video games, but, and this isn't science at all. It's fantasy. But in that, it just reminded me of it because in that universe, there's like di different dimensions and humans came from another dimension and then inhabited earth. So we're not from earth. 
So that just reminded me. I doubt that's what happened in, in our world, but you well, know. I, I mean, we could get into the philosophical discussion of the multiverse and stuff like that 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 fuels that as well. And there's scientific excellent uh, evidence to suggest that that's valid, but like I think what happens is we kind of need human beings to take a step back and say, what if something could be silica based life? Yeah, you know, you look at our computers right now. Our computers are all silica based. So, and everyone's talking about artificial intelligence right now. So what if we build a computer, a quantum computer that's silica based, that has an artificial intelligence that does gain sentience? Does that become a new life form that's silica based life forms? Yeah. I mean, it reminds me of how, you know, was it Copernicus that said that the, we go around the sun and it's not the other way around where we're the center of the universe and nobody believed him for the longest right. time. And like, a son, Galileo or Newton, one of them had to, they had to change the theory because it was based off of the old way of thinking. Sure. You know, so even we should always go with science, you know, don't, don't ever distrust science because of that, but it's subject to change over time. You know, when new ways of thinking come about, new technology, um, we just have to allow ourselves to be able to think outside of that box, you know? Absolutely. And, and I think one of the problems we have with that is, um, Science has a way of jumping to conclusions. And when they don't have <clears throat> a nice, neat bow that they can tie on a, pro a, a package of knowledge, they kind of make things up. And we're sort of at that stage now where they can't explain the gravitational forces of the universe because there's not enough mass to account for it when you look at all the equations we have with the Big Bang. But it's happening and they can't explain it. So we came up with this idea of dark matter and dark energy. And the equations fit it, but we kind of made up the concept of it. And it's one of those, all right, well, let's make it up now and then we'll prove it later. And that works, you know, Einstein did that, you know, Einstein's theories on relativity and stuff hinged on what he called the cos cosmological constant. And it was a concept that he had to plug into his equations to fix observations to make the equations actually work. Now, granted, you know, years later, decades later, it turned out that he was probably right after they were able to prove it. But I think today's scientists are tending in that direction of, all right, let's just plug this number in to make these equations work so we can say we understand the universe. But really, we know the tip of the iceberg of what is about what the universe is about. Yeah, I mean, there's only so much you can do with the resources we have available, you know? So I guess for with stuff like that, like the, the cosmological constant, uh, it's more of a placeholder, right? And then exactly. once we figure out how to do it, we'll go back and, and change it. That's exactly but I, it. I think also, just in terms of like a societal sense, we have a tendency to just believe it because it's science. Or even like, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, I think, he's talked about how just because it's science doesn't mean you should automatically trust it all the way. Because science is always changing. It's fluid. Yeah. And, you know, there's theories and hypotheses and stuff like that. So it shouldn't be taken as a absolute fact, 100% right. of the time, you know? So it's as like we, taking it with a grain of salt. Sure, and as we learn more, our understanding of nature changes yeah. and our understanding of the universe. So, you know, I think we both agree that mathematically, they could, they being life forms, whether they're intelligent or not, could exist in the universe. So let's take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll discuss the costs of these projects and whether or not they're worth it for today's civilization. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. 
check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. So is it worth it? Before I invite you to answer that question, let me run down some numbers for you. So the Allen array, the Allen telescope that we talked about earlier, um, cost $50 million to build, and it costs about $2.5 million to run annually. The SETI Institute cost about $2 million per year to keep the research going, uh, and it takes $20 million a year to keep the activities going, the actual observations, the, end, the uh, observatories and stuff like that. Um, one of the latest programs that they had was Breakthrough Listen, which was another one to bring all these antennas together and expand our capability. That's a 10-year program that has about $100 million in funding. So we're looking at roughly an upfront cost of $200 million and then about another $5 million a year to maintain. Based on those numbers... And the benefits that we've discussed here, do you think it's worth it to continue funding SETI? I would say no. Um, I do think that the research and the advancements are important, but I also think that we have a lot of bigger fish to fry currently. Um, I, every month it's like a new apocalypse. So I think that, I mean, that's kind of a small amount of money in the grand scheme, like compared to everything else we spend money on. Um, you know, when it comes to like defense and stuff like that, which should also be reduced in my opinion, but that's another show. Um, I think that that money could be probably redistributed to more important things. Now, these people they are working for profit, right? They're getting paid. That the employees are getting paid, yes. The organizations are not for profit. Though. Okay. So you don't want to get rid of all those jobs and those people, their livelihoods, you know. But I do think that that money could be better distributed to serve a greater, more practical purpose um than this in the current world that we live in and and i think for the most part i would tend to agree with you um i don't think that the money that we're talking about is huge i mean you look at we just had what a four trillion dollar three trillion dollar stimulus package go out um so clearly uh the united states government can fund stuff like this i mean that's pocket change yeah. for our government. Um, I want to think that the benefit that we get is probably higher than that. Um, it's hard to put a tangible number on, on that, though. Yeah. Um, if that distributed computing project produces a winnable vaccine or contribute significantly yeah, yeah. to it, to coronavirus, I think it would definitely... Like, the Human Genome Project used that same uh, distributed uh, computing project uh, technology. So I think there's benefit there that's direct to the citizens, but I also think that there's an indirect benefit that we can't quantify at this point in time. And to see a program that's really not very expensive go away. I don't think we're in a position at this point in time to know if we lose a significant benefit. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I guess when I said what I said initially, I was thinking more of the space explanation exploration aspect of it. But, you know, you mentioning the coronavirus and like the computing side of it, how it's a data management kind of thing. I think that's definitely more of a more practical need, like I was saying. Um, I'd be curious to see more specifically how this money's broken down, like where it's going, what it's funding right. um, per year. Um, but I guess from that standpoint, it definitely would be more useful. And it is pocket change, so to keep it running, I guess, wouldn't really hurt anyone. And it would keep you know helping the families. Um, so yeah, I guess if they just redirected their focus more specifically just to d data management, it would definitely be better. Now, just to put things into perspective, I just did a quick uh, look up on 
what NASA's annual budget was for 2020. NASA's annual budget for 2020 is $22.63 billion. Oh, wow. That's way more than I thought it would be. Yeah. So. They're fine. SETI's fine. I they think can, SETI's yeah, okay. Yeah, they can stick around. Yeah, I mean, SETI's basically a, a you know, a decimal point <laughs> miscalculation <laughs> yeah. in there. Like, SETI, the funding for SETI is like the change that's lost mm -hmm. in NASA's couch. Yeah. How much money went to, like, PBS, you know? Because <laughs> I know they're cutting funds yeah, for that, too. That's the thing. I mean, we're we're cutting for programs that 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 we probably need. Yeah. It's just, it's when you see how it's all broken down and divvied up, especially because uh, what is he, NASA doing nowadays, you know? Like, because I know they're competing with the private sector, like with SpaceX and stuff like that. So right. they're losing to them because, you know, Elon Musk is shooting off a rocket like every week. Yeah. And so shooting like, his cars into space and everything. <laughs> yeah. I'm just not sure what NASA, I'm sure they have, I mean, they have the ISS. Are they, they're part of that. They're, you know, yeah. international and they're thing. focusing more on missions to Mars at this point, okay. too, as well. Uh, which, again, you have to look at what the advantages. You know, there's not a return on investment to be had there. So you have to hope that there's a scientific return on what you're getting out of there to send men to the moon, as opposed to sending probes to the moon. Because we're getting a boatload of scientific information and breakthroughs just from sending probes at this point. Um, so, but that's. That's a discussion for another podcast, I think. Um, so it might not be worth it, I think, is our conclusion. But it doesn't hurt to continue funding because there are mm -hmm. there are benefits that we get. Um, and I'm not going to go to another commercial here. Let's just continue the discussion straight on here with the last two questions that I have. Um, what happens if we find intelligent life? What do you think happens if we find intelligent life? I have no idea. I mean, we can barely negotiate with each other on earth. I mean, I think a halo for, um, uh, harvest, right. You know, within like a day, it was a full scale war. Um, and that might've been, you know, cause in that book there, there's the politics of the aliens and stuff like that contributed to it. But I think it would depend I think it would depend a lot on how they looked, honestly. Um, I think that we'd be very fearful if they looked like monsters, you know, like right. terrifying monsters. I think it would be very difficult to, uh, like, cohabitate with them. Not to mention the language, like, the communication issues. Right. Um, I read a book. It was like a pulp action novel years ago. Um, and it dealt with, you know, the action hero had, fights aliens, basically. But the aliens communicated through math. Because math is universal, um, so that they would use but math is hard. Math is hard, but good <laughs> thing we pay SETI <laughs> to do the math for us. Um, no, they would use the crop circles. They kind of oh yeah, yeah yeah yeah. It ended up being that they were, it was like ratios and like pi and stuff like that. So that was how they communicated. So I think if we could put something like that together um, to get over that language barrier, because I think that would there's the visual how they would if they look like monsters, but I think then the biggest thing is probably language how we'd communicate with them at all if they wanted to communicate. So let me ask you this. So back in the 70s and 80s, we had the Planetary Society decide that we're going to send space probes out into outer space. And on those space probes, we are going to put, they made a golden record yeah. with all these sounds and instructions how to play it. But they put a star map up there. And they put a star map up with um, pulsars, which are constant you know, see if you had variables that you can actually navigate in three-dimensional space with. And they basically put a map as to where we are. Do you think that was a good idea? I don't know. I mean, that's assuming that if someone were to read that map, they'd be able to use it. Right. Um, I guess you're alluding to like an alien invasion kind of thing. I, I'm not alluding to anything because even after that, we, we had a situation in the eighties where we decided that we were going to send a message out to where we thought there was civilized life in the universe. And we sent this high powered burst of radio message out to basically say, Hey, we're here. Um, I, I guess my question to you is, are we advanced enough as a civilization to want to advertise to other people i don't know that that stuff comes off like a vanity thing to me 
like it's more because it was mostly like celebrities, right? Like musicians and stuff that got to. Well, no, I mean it was everything. Like they, okay. they put sounds of the earth and okay. stuff like that on there. Um, I, I still think it's a vanity thing, like our pride, you know, because we think we have to feel like we're important, right? Yeah. So if we're the ones that say, "Hey, we're over here. Here's our culture. Here's our planet." I think I don't really think it has anything to do with finding anything. I think it's us trying to validate ourselves, you know, right. and and prove to ourselves that we are important in the grand scheme of the universe, which we're not. <laughs> well, and and the reason I ask is you you bring up Halo, yeah. you know, and Halo's a, a fictional futuristic space world. In in the Halo universe, they have what's called the Cold Protocol. And the Cold Protocol was designed specifically to purge any information or references to where Earth's home was from any spaceships that might be taken over by aliens after they discovered aliens. And the whole purpose of that was so that the bad guys couldn't find where our home world was. Where at the same time, we're, we're putting spotlights out there and saying, hey, you know, we've got a used car sales here. You guys mm -hmm. want to come, <laughs> come see what we got? Um, even Stephen Hawking commented on this before he passed away of we as a civilization aren't ready for that. Um, and the strange thing is, is like, there's a lot of controversy around aliens, right? The air force just released, uh, footage from some Navy fighters, some gun footage from Navy fighters showing UFOs. Um, obviously not declaring that they're alien objects or anything like that. It's but UFO in the literal sense, unidentified flying objects. Exactly. Exactly. And if you watch ancient aliens, you see all these references to what people think or interpret as aliens, but you also know of all the different, um, conspiracy theories, we'll say mm -hmm. of the government trying to hold that information up. And, and it even comes through in mainstream media, um, where, the president, you know, when, when Clinton was in office, he wanted to go to see the alien bodies at Roswell and was told that they didn't have any and stuff like that and, and made public statements to the effect, which was interesting. Um, but there's this overall sense that the government doesn't think we as a civilization are ready to know about aliens, whether there are out there or not, you know? So if we're not, why are we shining a spotlight <laughs> out there advertising where we are? Yeah, I just think, I don't know. I still think it's a vanity thing. And I think in terms of the government holding back secrets or whatever, uh, in that book I mentioned earlier about aliens using math, in that book they use alien technology to make like an Apple-style corporation. So they take the alien technology and they make super advanced tech with it. Right. And the government uses it to make like, you know, Weapons and things like that, which I think is the more realistic way it would go. Absolutely, um, but that's what some that's something Congress can wrap its head around because it can make money off. Yeah, of it. exactly. Um, and there's a movie I don't know if you've seen it, uh, Section Eight, where oh, no. so basically the aliens come to Earth and they just hover over uh, South Africa, but then one of the main character ends up getting infected where he starts to turn into one of these aliens. So the first thing they do is they kidnap him and they strap him to one of the guns because only the aliens are biologically able to use the guns. So he has like an alien arm. They strap okay. him down and force him to fire it to, you know, make weapons out of it. So I think those are the more practical. If we did for some reason have alien technology, how we'd use it. But it would be so obvious. I feel like if we had alien technology that it wouldn't be worth hiding. I think what's way scarier is the weapons we're coming up with by ourselves. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, chemical agents, missiles, drones that can wipe out whole towns, you know, with the click of a button. I just think, I don't know, aliens and, and space, it seems like a distraction. Like, you know, we're ignoring the real issues. Right. Or the the bigger, more like, scary implications. We don't need aliens to wipe us out. Yeah. We're perfectly right. capable of doing it ourselves. Yeah. Excuse me. It's like that episode of The Twilight Zone where everybody thinks there's aliens, so they turn on one another. Right. There's no aliens, but then at the end, it's the aliens up on the hill being like, oh, we got them. <laughs> you know? So, I don't know. I think it's, it's, we should be more focused on being more unified, which going back to Halo, 
the world unifies once the aliens show up. Right. You know, so. And it's funny because with all the coronavirus stuff going on now, a lot of references have been made to the fact that this is our alien invasion, right? This is that worldwide event that we have our chance to now rally around and bring people together and do what needs to happen and show that we can cooperate. Everyone can cooperate with each other for the betterment of mankind. Except we can't. And well, <laughs> and we're not. Yeah, even in the United States, states are fighting over, and I'm sure that's because of how that equipment is being distributed, but states are being forced to fight over medical equipment. Yeah. So I just, I don't know. I think we talked about this on another podcast, like uniting the world and how it was impossible, but... <laughs> I just, I, I think it. I think if you're going to unite the world, it has to be something that is literally a world-ending yeah. event. That if you don't come together, we're all going to to bite the bullet. And I think it have to be not human. Like, yeah. I, th- I think I don't know. It's just we really need a good alien invasion. Yeah. That's like at the end of. I don't know if you ever watched or read Watchmen, but at the end, it's set during the Cold War. So the bag spoilers for a thirty year old graphic novel. Um, <laughs> The bad guy's plan is to basically stage this alien invasion over New York so a big giant squid falls out of the right, sky right. and kills like 30 million people. And it works for a time. But it, it brings the world together and stops the Cold War and stops us from blowing each other up. Meanwhile, the alien's fake. He made it himself. You know, he transposed it from another dimension. It was a man that did that, but it looks like an alien. So, you know, we all united behind it. And I think something like that w- might work. But even then, if we're going to use the technology for weapons... That makes another arms race, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that that's <laughs> the way the human race goes. But anyway, uh, I think that was all I had. I'm glad we're leaving on we a high always, note here. Always end on a high note. <laughs> um, I will invite everyone to subscribe to us on uh, Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe to our video podcasts at Insights Into Things. You can subscribe to our audio podcast at podcast.insightsintotomorrow.com. We stream six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can visit us on the web at www.insightsintothings.com where you can get our audio, video, our YouTube Uh, Or you can go direct to youtube.com slash insights into things. We have transcripts of our podcasts. Uh, You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can hit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. Or you can email us directly at comments at insights into things.com. And I think that's it for us. Uh, Thank you for joining me this week, Sam. I know we've kind of been... On hiatus for a while with yeah. the lockdown. Uh, it's good to have you in the studio and a uh, chance to talk to you again. Hopefully, we, sh- we won't wait. We won't have to wait as yeah. long for the next one. So that's it. We're done. Another one in the books. <laughs>